older folks may associate my name with the flour mill. I ran for many years at the foot of West Avenue at the Kankakee River Dam. But that was one of only many activities I was involved in since coming to the city in 1854. Kankakee was just a year old at the time, but it was a growing, bustling town with lots of opportunities for an ambitious young man such as myself. I was 34 years old when I came to the city from Ohio with my young family. I had been a farmer in Ohio, and in fact, I had won a state medal for growing the best Osage Orange Hedge. <laughs> that influenced my crop of choice when I began farming here in Cape. I partnered with a fellow named Leah's to grow Osage Orange. Some may know the plant better as a hedge apple. The hedge plant was in great demand for fencing because trees were so scarce here on the Illinois River. Our first year, we had a big contract with the Illinois Central Railroad to provide 200,000 plants, enough to fence off 20 miles of right of way. The IC used the fencing to keep cattle off of their tracks. Unfortunately, a drought set in and we lost our entire crop and the contract. Our next crop didn't fare much better. 300 acres of room. Another drought wiped that crop out, and my partner gave up, selling off his share of our so far unsuccessful business to George Bay. The next year, persistence did pay off. George and I harvested a bumper crop, and we made a good profit. Now, I understand these days, rooms like just about everything else are made out of plastic. But for centuries, the bristles that were used to make brooms were made out of broom corn. Every town had at least one broom maker, and there were large factories in cities like Chicago. We would grow 250 to 300 acres per year, and we bought the crops off of smaller farmers from throughout the county. We built a good-sized warehouse on Evergreen, just south of Station Street, where we would process and pack the bristles for out-of-town shipping. I was on, always on the lookout for a business opportunity, and a good one came along in 1865 when I heard that Al G. Dean of the Durham Dean and Dixon Flour Mill was looking to retire. I made him an offer, and I became partner in the mill. A few years later, I bought out the remaining partner, and I became sole proprietor. I ran that mill for over 30 years until my sons James and Samuel took over. They've done well. They've increased production of flour to as much as 100 barrels per day. Mentioning James and Samuel reminds me, I haven't given notice and proper credit to my good wife there. We were met and were married back in Ohio in 1841, and we eventually had 10 children. <laughs> seven of which, two girls and five boys, would survive until adulthood. As you can imagine, with all of my business and civic interests, most of the work raising the children fell upon Mary's shoulders. One of the activities that kept me busy in the years after acquiring the mill was how to use the power created by the mill wheel at the Pinky River Dam. I came up with the idea of supplying power to every building on West Avenue, north of River Street. The only building remaining in Today is the former Sully's restaurant, which was a linseed oil mill in the 1860s. Other, other businesses on West Avenue at the time were a blacksmith, blacksmith shop, a wire works, a machine shop, two iron foundries, and a paper mill. Now, mind you, this is the days before electricity, but I came up with a system of belts and pulleys driven by the mill wheel at the River Dam that supply power to every one of those businesses on the block. You can think of it as Kankakee's first industrial park. Now, all of my, oh, I also became interested in steam power, the kind that drives railroad locomotives. I became president of the Kankakee and Illinois River Railroad in 1868, which had already began construction. 
I raised nearly $800,000 from local investors, a tidy sum in those days, to help with surveying, grading, and building the right-of-way through King County. Unfortunately, a financial panic in 1873 caused us to stop construction. It did resume in the late 1880s, and that railroad did become successful. It would be later known as the Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa, or 3I, and would become part of the New York Central System. Not all of my activities were business-related. I was active politically in the Republican Party and later in the Prohibition Party. And during the 1860s, during the Civil War, I served as Kankakee County Treasurer, and I served one term as Kankakee's Mayor in the 1870s. I was particularly proud of my work as Chairman of the Committee that created Kankakee's first Central School. It was a three-story brick building on the corner of Indiana and Merchant that replaced several smaller schools that were scattered throughout the city. That building served Kankakee students for nearly 100 years. One Central School student, George Gray Bernard, went on to worldwide fame as a sculptor. I would, along with my wife, Mary, and our children, we were active at the First Methodist Church of Kankakee, which we, by 1867, we realized we had outgrown the building we were in that was on uh, Dearborn and Merchant. We began to raise funds to build a larger church building on Harrison. That summer, an English nobleman by the name of Lord Walker was visiting our city and began attending our services. Learning of our fundraising efforts, he pledged $30,000 to help draw up plans for a larger, grander building. Unfortunately, by summer's end, when construction was well underway, he and his wife boarded a train, leaving behind a pile of debts, including that unpaid pledge. Our congregation members took on great personal debt, including mortgaging their homes in order to complete the project. It did prove worthwhile, resulting in the beautiful church structure known today as the Asbury United Methodist Church. When my time on this earth came to an end in 1900, my funeral was held in that church that we worked so hard to build. And then I took up residency here at Mound Grove, where ever since I have been dead. <laughs> Greetings. My name is Melissa Carrier Small. And I'm her grandson, what Charles Small. I was born in 1834 in New Hampshire. Now our family moved to the state of Indiana, and that's where I was raised. And that is also where I met my beloved husband, Gabriel Huntington Small. Why he was an agriculturalist. And the position. Well, we married when I was 19 years old, and then we heard about the smallpox in the pioneering town of Cape Key, and that is where we decided to move to help out the situation. So we moved at Rockville Settlement along the Bourbonnet Township. Now, after a short amount of time, we bought 47 acres in Cape Key, and that's where we built our house. From, from what I hear, it is still there. It is on the ground is what you may know as the Governor's Spa Memorial. Now, like most families, we were a big family back then. We had six children, four girls and two boys. Our first daughter was May. She was a frail child, and unfortunately she died at the age of 17. Next, we had Suzanne, and then the boys came along. First John, and then Lennington. And that was my father. That's right, Leslie. That was his father, and we called him Lynn at the time. And then our next two was Callista, named after me, and then our youngest was Mabel. Now, can, you can imagine, our house was a busy, bustling house with six children, a consulting office, and farming operations. There were always people coming in and out. If you were to go and visit today, 
you would go in and there'd be the parlor, the dining room, the kitchen, and in the back corner is the consulting office, as they called it back then, along with the bedrooms upstairs and the children's play area. What all of, also you would see is Suzanne's display of art and drawing on the walls in all of the rooms. Suzanne was a great artist. She studied abroad in Spain and in France. In fact, she studied side by side with Monet. Now she also had a gallery in Chicago and in Kankakee and was an art teacher at Kankakee Central. And she was commissioned $1,000 to paint a portrait of our governor, Jackson Yates. Richard Yates. Richard Yates. Oh, wrong mind. Richard Yates. And it still stands today.
we increased that subscription number from 1,100 to over 10,000. Tell you what, by 1931, there were only two newspapers left in the town, the Kentucky Republican News and the Kentucky Daily News. Well, we formed an alliance and we did a merger. We became the Kankakee Republican Daily News. Now that's a long name to put at the top of that newspaper every day. It took a lot of ink. So in 1945, we shortened the name and changed it to Kankakee Daily Journal. I think they still exist today, called the Daily Journal. I wasn't just involved in, in publication and journalism, though. I also kept involved in financial matters. I was appointed to the board of directors at First uh, Trust and Savings Bank for many years. And then, believe it or not, while my, my dad was governor of the state of Illinois, I was appointed to a state position. <laughs> I was put in charge of all large building projects in the great state. Now, everything has kept roads, because you know, my father loved the roads. He wanted to be in charge of the roads. But I was in charge of overseeing some of the great building projects in the state during the 1920s. We built many of the locks and dams on the Illinois River. We built the locks and dams at Hennepin, Starved Rock, Lockport, and several other places along the river. I also oversaw the building of the, of the Mantino State Hospital. It was the largest hospital for the mentally insane in the state for many years. Now I believe it's the Mantino Veterans Hospital. And then we also, in 1948, we were able to donate 20 acres of our land from a small farm. We donated 20 acres to the state of Illinois. They built a memorial to my father called the Governor Glenn Small Memorial Park. And they also built a historical and arts building, which is now the Kankakee Historical Museum. And then, in 1953, it was the 100-year anniversary, the centennial anniversary for the great city of Kankakee. So at the time, we raised some funds, and we built the centennial as an addition to the Historical Society Museum. That is now the main entry point of the museum. We do special events and special displays there on a regular basis. It's a great place to visit if you get a chance. Now you can imagine being involved in living from 1886 into the 19, well, into the 1950s. I saw all the things that happened in this great country in the first half of the 20th century. We reported on all of them, being in the newspaper business, and we tried to report the news as we heard it. You can imagine, from the time I was born, I saw the growth of the telephone, the growth of electricity, indoor plumbing. Do you like that, Grandma? We had indoor plumbing. It was a white metal pot. Ah, this, this is a little better than that. So, and we had the advent of the automobile air travel. We saw it all. We reported all of it. We saw two world wars, the Great Depression. You know, we had many famous people who came through Kankakee. We reported on all of them. The Marx Brothers came here in 1916. Amelia Earhart came here in 1935, just a few months before she vanished out of the city. Richard Nixon came here in 1952. Adlai Stevenson, they'd come and they'd stop. The politicians would come, hop on the train, come on the train, make those whistle stops back in the day and make their speeches and then head on down the road. I could go on and on. Those were great times, great stories that we reported. It was a great time to be alive in Kankakee. Great time to report all that great news. Well, Back in the day, we used to use the old typewriters to uh, type our stories. At the end of the story, we write the number 30. That meant it was the end. Well, unfortunately, my number 30 came January 11, 1957. After a short illness, I died in my home on Station Street in Kankakee. After the funeral service at First Methodist Church, they brought me here, and I lie in state with the rest of my family. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard S. Dewey, and I'm proud to have served as the superintendent of Kankakee's, what I would say, Kankakee's most historic and important district. Y'all know what it is. <laughs> it's the one located across the river from Cobb Park. You probably know it as Shapiro Developmental Center today, or if you have a longer memory, as Kankakee State Hospital. So when it opened in 1880, it was called Illinois Eastern Hospital for the Insane, and it quickly became the largest of the four state hospitals for the mentally ill in Illinois. Illinois Eastern Hospital pioneered an important change in the way that mentally ill patients were housed and treated. 
So in the late 1800s, most state institutions were being built according to a plan developed by a Dr. Kirkbride. And this Kirkbride design consisted of multi-story buildings connected to a center administration area. These uh, large Kirkbride wards would house several hundred patients and they would also group the patients into violent and non-violent. So the initial design for Illinois Eastern Hospital was actually a Kirkbride plan and it had would feature a tall center building with a clock tower on top and then three-story wings on either side. And most of that structure is still in use today. Uh, the clock tower is a familiar local landmark. But before construction began, an important change was made to those plans. Several smaller wards, or cottages as they were called, were constructed. And these cottages would house uh, fewer than 100 patients usually, and they would be a more home-like setting for those who were, who were there. In addition, they would be able to easily be able to the patients by the time of their illness, and they can have more effective treatment. So by the end of the 1800s, Illinois Eastern Hospital became the second largest state hospital in the entire country, had over 2,000 patients. But more importantly, it was the largest hospital that was devoted to this cottage plan, and it served as a model for the, for the construction of the new institutions being built all over the United States. So I was appointed superintendent of this new hospital in 1879. And I had been a physician for 10 years. I was born in the state of New York in 1845. And then I received my medical degree from Michigan State University in 1869. After that, I moved to New York City and served as assistant physician and surgeon at Brooklyn City Hospital. I then had the opportunity to gain some field experience and by serving in the Franco-Prussian War. So I enlisted with the German Army as a field surgeon, served on the battlefield for about a year. The war ended and I was discharged. Since I was over there in Europe, I decided to have a semester of additional medical training at the University of Berlin. So I returned to the United States in the fall of 1871, I was offered a position as assistant physician of Illinois Northern Hospital for the Insane, and that's located in Elgin, Illinois. Since I had a secure professional position, I decided, well, I can become a married man. And so I married a Lillian White in my hometown of Clinton, New York. We were married in January 24th. By the time we moved here to Kankakee, we were the proud parents of two children, a son, Richard, and a daughter, Ella. However, tragedy struck a year later. Uh, Lillian died in childbirth. She was only 30 years old. And in fact, she's buried right here. Um, the baby that was born is also buried here, lived for about uh, nine months. So six years later, I decided to remarry. My second wife, Mary Brown, was, um, like myself, a native of New York. She was the daughter of a physician, and she actually had a medical degree herself. She decided not to practice medicine, but she decided to work in education. She was the director of Chicago Trading School for Nurses when we were married. We were able to add two more children for our family in 1887, a daughter, Eleanor, and in 1891, a son, Donald. We were certainly grateful that the state provided a large house on the hospital grounds for our growing family. So in um, 1893, I'd been in Kankakee for 14 years, decided I wanted to open my own private practice. So I resigned my position and moved to Chicago to open up an office there. 
Since I had experience at Illinois Eastern Hospital, I was also asked to be director of the Milwaukee Sanitarium. That was an established institution located in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. That is just west of Milwaukee. So for the next 25 years, I worked at that institution in Milwaukee and also saw private patients. My professional life was quite busy. It included a three-year term as editor of a professional magazine or professional journal, today known as the American Journal of Psychiatry. And I authored over 40 papers on mental health subjects. In addition, I was chair of clinical professor of mental diseases at Northwestern Medical School for Women. And I was given the opportunity to give several talks at colleges and universities. So in 1920, I turned 75 years old, decided it's time to retire. So I closed my private practice, resigned my position at the Milwaukee Sanitarium, and moved to California, where I could enjoy some warmer winters and I could have a more relaxed lifestyle. I spent most of my retirement years just writing about my experiences in the mental health field, and I was almost done with the manuscript when I died in near Los Angeles in 1933. It's my understanding that my oldest daughter Ethel, who was my editor, was able to get the manuscript published in 1936 by the University of Chicago Press. My family only thought it fitting that I be laid to rest here in the community where I helped shape a new approach to the care and treatment of the mentally ill uh, superintendent of Illinois Eastern Hospital. My name is Thomas Durham, and today I should like to share with you the path which led me here to Cape County as the very first American-born settler in Bourbonnet Grove. See, I was born in Virginia in the year 1784, which was the same year that my mother had joined the Quakers at Blackwater Monthly Meeting. She was accompanying my father for about two years since his own conversion at the same meeting. Now the first Quakers, as some of you may know, uh, are, are often called the Religious Society of Friends. And they were established in England back in over 1650, not about that time, after breaking away from the established Church of England. Now the Quakers emphasized a strong personal relationship with Jesus, as well as reading and studying the Bible, and the equality of all people. As a result, the Quakers refused to participate in war, drink alcohol, swear oaths, and to enslave others. My Quaker tradition emphasized the abolition of slavery, prison reform, social justice, and philanthropy. This was the religious and cultural environment that I was born in. In 1782, the year of my father's Quaker conversion, he freed our family's slaves, 36-year-old Maria and her eight children range in age from 3 to 17. Now at the time my father maintained the duty of acting as their guardian until the boys were 21 and the girls were 18, which was the legal age of majority at the time. Um, father also purchased and freed two of Maria's close relatives, a uh, 13-year-old girl and a 23-year-old boy named Squire Durham. Many of these newly freed uh, individuals took on the family name of Durham. My father proclaimed that freedom was the natural right of all mankind. He was a good man, but he died in 1794, when I was only nine. When I was 21, our family, including many of our now newly free Negro members, migrated across the Blue Ridge Mountains into the Great Smoky Mountains, the Blount County in eastern Tennessee. You see, at the time, there was subsistence farming there, and there were very few slave owners. We joined the Newberry Monthly Meeting, which was a Quaker meeting, and became part of that community. My mother died there two years later, and uh, shortly after that, I met and fell in love with young Margaret Wiley, who everybody called Peggy. 
We were married in 1811, and uh, as things happened, not much after that, our first child, James W., was born, followed by Thomas, who went to be with the Lord. He was on the street. Often when God takes from us, he gives us something as well, though. And that same year, my daughter Barbara was there. By 1818, Peggy had given birth to our fourth child, Artemis. Now, it was about that same time that we were encouraged to move further north by a sermon of the great Quaker preacher, Zachariah Dix. We were excited by this sermon, and we couldn't wait to move into the newly established state of New Guinea. Our new community at Lick Creek was rich in hardwood forests, and even had a free Negro settlement. But many of us kept dreaming about a move further west, west of the Wabash River, where we wanted to settle on the fertile prairie land. But we couldn't possibly consider a move into the future state of Illinois while slavery was allowed to exist there. It just didn't seem that we Quaker abolitionists were destined to move any further west. However, in September of 1824, a referendum came before the Illinois General Election. That referendum was calling for a constitutional amendment to legalize slavery in Illinois. That referendum was defeated by a vote of 66 40 to 49-72, making slavery illegal in Illinois. The very next year, 1825, my family finally made the move into Illinois, where we settled at Vermilion Grove, a Quaker settlement just to, uh, north of South Bend. Uh, during one of my many trips up to the Chicago area, 1834, I made camp at Twin Oaks, which was named for two large burr oak trees on, burr oak trees on the property. One of those two oak trees still stands today, and you may have seen it. It's located at what is commonly called the Perry Farm Park. That way. I was amazed by the beauty of the land between the Bourbonnet Road, the Bourbonnet Creek, and the Cape Key River. So much so that in 1835, I purchased Gurdon Hubbard's 160 acres of the John View Reserve, which was known as Twin Oaks. When Peggy and I arrived with our family, by this point we had nine children, five daughters and four sons, we were greeted by the Potawatomi, the wigwam of boughs, which served as an early settlement, an early shelter for our family. That same year, 1835, we opened 28 years In 1837, I purchased another 164 acres, extending my property further to the east, and to the hardwood forest and the limestone canyon on the west. That canyon is commonly known as the Indian Plate, and it's located where the Bourbonnet Creek runs into the Kentucky River. In 1836, the farm was incorporated into the Rock Village precinct of Will County, and it was at that same time that I was elected as Rock Village Precinct Commissioner for a two-year term. During my time as commissioner, a log schoolhouse was built uh, just north of the Chicago Danville Road in its junction with the Bourbonnet Road. That log school was a one-room schoolhouse, which was about 20 foot by 20 foot and one and a half stories high, and it served students from 1837 until 1848. During my tenure as commissioner, I also petitioned that the Bourbonnet Road, which is now Route 102, become a state And in 1849, I was elected as postmaster of Bourbon Acre, where I remained until 1853 when Kent County was incorporated. On March 14, 1854, I died, and I was buried on the farm that I loved. I hold the distinction today of being the only person who you will meet who was not buried in this cemetery. You can, however, visit my grave. Today, a modern gravestone marks the location of my burial out at Perry Farm. My sons took over the farm upon my death, and they did, they did a good job, but unfortunately, by 1866, they had fallen into financial difficulty, and they were forced to sell the farm. Interesting story, though. My son-in-law, David Perry, that name might ring a bell, he surprised them by purchasing the farm and lending them the money. David Perry, right here, had married my daughter, Martha Durham, right next to him, 
and uh, they married back in 1845, and they resided just east of the Durham Farmstead. They later moved into the family farmhouse, and they took care of my beloved wife, Peggy, until her death. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out today, learning about my life and the history of our county. Enjoy this beautiful day. Have a wonderful time. William Gordon Swabell, and this is my great nephew. I'm Fred Swanell. I was named for my great uncle's brother, my grandfather, Fred, who was married in this plot in 1907. Now, if you grew up in the Kankakee area, you might recognize the Swanell name. And that's because our family has been very active in the business community in the area. blossoming, growing place at the junction of the Kankakee River and Hubbard's Trail, which connected Danville to Chicago. It truly was a border town, with the more populated areas out to the east and the wide open plains to the west, stretching as far as the eye could see. Yes, many buildings were going up to house both families and businesses. And I constructed two of them, one on Rain Street and one facing the Kankakee on River Street. Now, taking what I had learned from my father, I opened a dry goods store in Momets. In 1853, my grandfather returned to Momets to establish his first business, a drug store. The Illinois Central Railroad track had been completed from Chicago to the Kankakee River, about a dozen miles west of Momets. In short order, the county of Kankakee was formed, and the town began to grow along the tracks north of the river. And when that new city, called Kankakee, defeated Moments in an election to determine the county seat, my grandfather and great uncle William decided that their future lay in Kankakee as well. Yes, I sold my business in Moments, and I bought a track of land just north of the river, next to an unpaid Put up a stone building, and uh, even though I was known as a dry goods industry, my first entry to the was a drug store. And in 1857, my grandfather left his drug store and also made the move to the fast growing town of Kankakee. But since great uncle William had already established a drug store, my grandfather traded places with him and started the business that would bear our family's name for nearly 50 years. 
the Swan L Dry Goods Store sold clothing, textiles, and other merchandise. Now, next to my drugstore was another dry goods store. Now, this one was owned by Mr. J. Sibley at the time. And as luck would have it, in the spring of 1856, Mr. Sibley would introduce me to a special guest from out east. This is Sibley's younger sister, Laura. She was intelligent, well-spoken, and beautiful, and we quickly fell in love. So we were off to New York to get married. When we returned to Kankakee, we were amazed to see a huge crowd gathered on the platform of the Illinois Central Railroad Way Station. It's as if the entire town had come out to greet us. So that crowd, along with Kankakee's own Silver Cornet Band, escorted us to the Van Meter Hotel for the greatest wedding reception you ever did see. Now that hotel, located at, at uh, 4th Avenue and Oak Street, is where I had lived since first coming. And funny enough, I also resided in a local hotel for a good portion of my life as well. Except in my case, I simply didn't want to be bothered with maintaining a house in my later years of life. So I moved into the Hotel Kankakee. It was downtown at the corner of Schuyler Avenue and Merchant Street. I lived on the sixth floor of the hotel for nearly a quarter century. Laura and I lived in very, uh, very many, many prominent locations in Kankakee years. Our first apartment, though, was a three-story business block that I built south of Court Street. The first floor of that building housed my drugstore and your grandfather's dry goods store. Laura and I lived on the second floor at the Masonic Temple. They met on the third floor. In 1862, Laura and I moved into a house that would become our home for the rest of our lives. Large, comfortable place located on five blocks or five plots of land just west of Harrison Avenue between Court Street and Oak Street. Laura would grow to love the house, but at the beginning she would complain that it was very, very far from the center of town. Well, and speaking of notable locations, it was in 1916 that I made a snap decision that would prove to be a rather good one. I noticed that the Hack and Trishel Hardware Store on the southwest corner of Court Street and Dearborn Avenue was for sale. I bought the store and I renamed it Swan L Hardware. Once again, the Swan L family name was displayed on a Court Street business for a full 50 years from 1916 to 1966. Swan L Hardware used one of the oldest buildings in Kankakee to store our stock of merchandise. We rented the old Lemuel Milk Carriage House, the stone barn on North Indiana Avenue, which today houses the French Heritage Museum. But I knew the building well, as our old family home was just across the street on the property which now sits the, the National Guard Armory, or the Recreation Center. In 1966, I sold the business to the First Trust and Savings Bank which closed Dearborn Avenue and built the tall building, which today houses PNC Bank. Banks played a role in my life's misfortune as well, it's hard to say. I was involved in very many business activities throughout my career, from retail stores to the construction and management of buildings, the planning of the Kankakee, Indiana Railroad, and I even was owner of a paper mill, what's now Roma Park. But my last venture in Kankakee was the commercial bank of Kankakee. Unfortunately, due to mismanagement of the bank by my partner, I had to close the bank and assume all of its obligations. In the end, I was fortunate to keep my house and part ownership of the Waldman paper mill. One of the darkest days in my life's journey occurred during the terrible Spanish flu epidemic in 1917, <clears throat> which killed thousands of people across the world. Kankakee was hit rather hard, and our local hospital had trouble keeping up with the number of sick people. So we opened the Masonic Temple to help out. Entire families would arrive for treatment, and many people died. But our family was fortunate, as only my 
wife and daughter contracted minor cases and both recovered quickly. I consider myself uh, fortunate and blessed as well. After my tribulations with the bank, I was able to re-enter my business career and mostly manage buildings and pay the key for the rest of my life. Through my work and those of your grandfather, I know who I am. Uh, I died to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> See, George, I told you that was a terrible joke. My husband, George B. Hewling. I'm, I'm Helen Hewling. I told him that was a terrible joke. He goes, no, tell him, they'll laugh. I said, okay. So I apologize. Blame him. <laughs> George's family came to North America in 1644 and landed in Rhode Island. He was one of eight children. He was after school, a teacher, a mercantile owner, and he moved here and became a property buyer and a loan business. Now his idea was that he would buy up this property so that people could have it at a reasonable price. And of course, he had the loan business with it. He wanted to make sure that they had a good, established place to do business with. He was a wonderful, loving, caring man. Most people just thought the sun rose and set on Georgia. They found him funny, uh, kind-hearted, loving. They found only one fault with him. He was a Democrat. In a heavily Republican area as Kankakee was, even at that point in time. Um, my family came here in 1851 from Loda, New York, the Samuel Knights. We landed in Bourbonnais Grove the first time. At 815, in 1853, we moved here to Kankakee when it became the county seat. And that's where George and I first met. And that's where we fell in love and we got married. We got married in 1867. I was 32. I figured by then my parents were going, is she ever going to get out of the house? But I did, because luckily I found this wonderful, charming, kind man of George V. Hewitt. We were married at St. Paul's Episcopal Church, the church with the red door. At that point in time, it was a, it was a wooden structure that was on the corner of Skyler and Merchant Street. They tell me now that there's something called a farmer's market there. Is that where you go to buy a farm? I don't know. Anyway, we were married there, and we were married by the Reverend Dwayne Phillips. Reverend Dwayne Phillips had just arrived from Bennington, Vermont, which coincidentally was where George was born. We loved the church so much. They greeted us with open arms, caring, loving, kind, so much fact that when George died in 1894, he bequeathed him $5,000 to build a new church. George believed in making sure that things could last forever. A wooden structure doesn't last forever, whereas a stone one would. And so he gave him $5,000 and eventually they built the house, they built the church out of Bedford Stone in 1900. Um, he, we went to church every Sunday. Rain, snow, sleet, hail, every Sunday. It helped a heck of a lot that we only lived two blocks away, but we still went every Sunday until George died. When George died, I, I could not, I could not make myself sit in a pew without him. It, it doesn't mean we forgot about the church because he had given them the $5,000 to build the new. In 1900, when the church was finished, I went to the dedication, and I noticed that there was one thing missing in the church. When you go to church, you go to uplift your spirits, you go to feel better, 
And one of the ways you feel better is through the sharing of music. But they had no organ. So I gave them $2,500 in George's memory to have an organ delivered. When the or organ was delivered, that's when my last time of going to church happened. I went there long enough to see it installed. I left and I never went back. But that does not mean I forsook the church. I did not. In 1851 and 1853, when we finally moved here, Kankakee was still a very raw frontier town. I mean, there was, uh, there, were, there were vigilantes, there were horse dealers, there were plenty of bars, there were all kinds of fights. Uh, it just happened. But by 1873, the town had really come together and it really started working as a cohesive group. We had lots of churches, lots of stores, lots of schools, and many organizations. But the one thing it lacked was something that George would love. Because George being a teacher, what's the one thing teachers need? They need books. So I started the li Women's Library Association here in Kankakee. Our idea was to bring the library into fruition and make it a reality. Well, we started collecting books. And we even had a storefront it's right smack dab in the middle of 4th Street. It was by membership only, and we did it that way for 20 years. Then I noticed we were getting kind of cramped in that little tiny spot. So I said, I'll donate $5,000 for a new library, and I'll give you the land. So they thought that was a very good idea. As often good ideas happen, somebody came along and said, hmm, maybe we should have a library. The city council got together, and Dr. Andrew Cutler, who was a dentist, and by the way, a bookstore owner, said, oh yes, we should have a library. Do uh, Thomas Brayton, who was the mayor at the point in time, said to Dr. Cutler, you start investigating and, and let's see what we can come up with. Well, it didn't take long for Dr. Cutler to realize that I had donated not only $5,000, but a place to put it. A month later, in their infinite wisdom, the city council said, we'll match your $5,000 and we'll make it available to all the taxpayers of Kentucky. Now. Even I could see the value of that. How many more people would actually access the library if it was going to be available to anybody who paid taxes in Kankakee? Well, not to say that Kankakee people can argue. However, the ladies' auxiliary, we had an argument. And they said, oh, we don't want to give our money. We don't want to give them our books. And finally, talked some sense of them, and at about 24 to 3, we gave all of our books to the new library that would be open to all taxpayers in Kankakee. What a great way to expand their knowledge, to make their imagination soar. Reading covers so many bases in your life. Well, the day of the dedication, I found the three-story edifice. Now, I only lived two houses away. It was fun to watch that come up. And of course, it was made of stone because stone is permanent. It was three stories high. The top floor was going to be an auditorium. At the dedication, Dr. Cutler made a speech. And he said that auditorium would forever be known as the George Auditorium. I was, I, we were very blessed to have that happen. In 1904, I died, two houses away. And before I died, I wrote a new will, not forgetting the church that I told you that we did not forsake. 
Churches are great. Organs are great. If you have no one to play it, it does you no good. I gave them $5,000 to make sure they had an organist to play to it. And so, when I died, that $5,000 went to George and I never had children. I mean, I was 32 when we got here. But we, we like to feel that we made an impact on this community. We like to feel that we've reached people through our, our kindness, our generosity, uh, our donations of money, our donations of land. You'll notice that there's a Madeline, a Bell, and a Truman. These were all family members that were his nieces and nephews. My family is buried right behind you. It's a family thing for all of us. I was so blessed to have him. We were so blessed to have him take a key. And we found out that if you take a key, if you just try, you can accomplish anything you want. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate that. Thank you. My name is Hamilton Kincaid And I live all but five of my almost 70 years right here in Kincaid County. I was born August 5th, 1848. Saratoga County, New York. My father, Andrew, was a farmer who looked westward from the, in the frontier. So in 1853, he relocated by our entire family to a farm he worked in the newly created Kankakee County. Now the farm was in Yellowhead Township, which is in the northeast corner of the, of the county near current day Grand Park. The area was partially wooded, but most of it was virgin prairie. It was five at the time that we moved. I don't recall a lot of our initial days, part days on the farm. My father used to tell me a lot about how difficult it was, though, to break up that virgin prairie sod with the, with the plow and a team of oxen. Now, I had plenty of chores over my time on the farm. And anytime I would ever try to complain, my father would always say, was never as tough as that sod busting. I was the second of six children in my family. My older sister Harriet, myself, my other younger younger brother Herbert were all born in Saratoga County. Um, my Yellowhead trio of Charles, Thomas, and Laura were all born on the farm. Now we didn't always have a whole lot of educational opportunity during that time. If there was a teacher even available, you might only go to school during three months of the year during the winter. During the spring, summer, and fall, we were definitely needed on the farm. I developed a love of reading. Uh, we had a couple books in our home. I also bought, bought, borrowed as much as I could from neighbors and friends. Now, at the age of 19, I moved from Kinkakee, we moved from the farm to Kinkakee. Now at this time, post-war Kinkakee was a growing and bustling community with a population of several thousand. I went to work for a man named Aram True, and he had a farm on the east side of town. We worked on an agreement that really helped both of us. I worked on the farm in the early morning and in the evening. That allowed me to go to school during the day at St. Paul's Academy in Kinkakee. I graduated. I'm actually taught there for a couple years before enrolling at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. In 1872, after getting my law degree, I returned to Kinkakee. I set up my first law office on the second, in the second floor of Warren Hickok's abstract office. I only practice civil law, planning to ever represent clients in any criminal case. And in the 1870s and 1880s, there was a lot of railroad construction going on at that time. So I became specialized in railroad law. In fact, on top of my perfect practice, for 17 years, I was the legal counsel for the 3I, the Iowa, Illinois, Indiana Railroad. And I represented it against larger railroads in the area, such as the Illinois Central, the Chicago, the Eastern Illinois, 
and the Big Four are firmly known as the Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago, St. Louis Bears. In addition to my activities in the law, I was also active in the local Republican Party. In 1885, I, I was asked to run for office for the Illinois House of Representatives uh, in the 19th I was successful in my campaign. During my time in, in this area, I was chairman of the Senate Commission for the Judiciary, as well as other committees in that. Now, in, these, in this time of, of our country, if you were representing the, the state of Illinois at, in the Senate, the U.S. Senate, you had to be voted on by members of the U.S. of the Illinois House and the Illinois House. In 1855, 1885, the uh, incumbent, General John A. Logan, was running against Democratic challenger William Boyd. Now, originally, the original vote, the, they were tied with 102 votes for Republicans, including myself, backing Mr. Logan, and a coalition of Democrats and distant Republicans uh, backing the war. Now, as so happens in, in the politics, there's a lot of backroom negotiations, the votes, the discussions, and, and uh, three months later, finally, one of the distant Republicans switched his vote to Logan, and he was able to, to retain his seat in the House. If the name General John A. Logan sounds familiar, it's because he's the person who proposed any Memorial Day to honor our American veterans. After a return from Springfield, I was asked to run for office again, this time in 1892, for the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, I was running against the popular Democratic incumbent, Gerald Snow. In the general election, there was a landslide victory by Democratic presidential candidate Grover, El Grover Cleveland. And this carried on to many other people on the same ticket. Uh, unfortunately, I was able to, to win and replace Mr. Snow in the U.S. House. But because I was going to be out of the area for two years, I needed to take care of my clients and my, my friends. So I brought on William Hunter as a partner. William Hunter later became a respected judge in the area. That was successful up until the year 1900, when my son Gary graduated from law school from the University of Iowa and came back to KKT and started off a, a successful son, father-son partnership. My two other sons, uh, Everett and Thank you for listening to me.